Okay, today, physical science time. Let's start over. I mean physical science time. Let's use this blue color shape. Today we are talking about my favorite thing, which is the elements. We're going to talk about the properties. We've already talked about the periodic table a little bit. We're going to revisit that some today. We're going to talk today about the properties of the elements. And really, a person can get in their discussion of this as detailed or not as they as they want. You can every I would say the shortest Wikipedia articles on any element are still probably more than a, a page long, and the longest ones are probably 40 pages long. You can really get as in-depth about any specific or any group of elements as you want to get. We're going to go pretty sh shallow surface level today. We'll talk about some of the interesting properties of a few of the elements, but mostly we're going to be talking about properties of families of elements. Let's start with that. So remind me, uh, what does the periodic table look like? Yeah, it looks like that. Good. Um, so I'm going to draw it over here, and we're going to keep this little drawing. Let me make sure that I can put this in a way that will be yep, over here. This is a pretty good drawing of the periodic table, if I do say so myself. Um, I'm going to come over here. So this would be, hey, hey. Just like um, any kind of graph or Cartesian coordinate, we have axes on this. We're not going to talk much more about the axes, but we have, we could say, an x or horizontal axis and a y or vertical axis. But on the periodic table, the reason we're not going to talk more about that in terms of axes is that we have special names for those. What do we call the horizontal rows on the periodic table? No? Periods. We call them periods. And then these, the vertical columns are called families, or they have another name too that you need to know. Yeah, those two words are used interchangeably, which means you need to know both, because on some questions on your test it'll say, name this family, and on some questions it'll say, name this group. You cannot on the video at all see what these say. These are actually exactly out of the screenshot, but the horizontal ones are periods, and the vertical ones are families or groups, and that's how we have them divided. There are seven periods on the periodic table. The first one is number one. Second one is number two. The third one is number three, four, five, six, seven. Four, five, six. Oh no! I drew eight because I drew seven lines, which makes eight. Oh, what an idiot. Okay. What about these guys? Are these eight and nine? Yeah, they're six and seven. Remember, um, these two, these two rows are actually not separate rows. They're, they're brought out so that it makes the periodic table um, easier to fit on a normal sized poster or table or something. But if we were going to, I'm going to draw this very, very roughly, but if we were going to really draw how the periodic table actually should be, it'd be like very, very roughly. But these two, these two rows down here actually go in right there. We just, we take them out so that for physical reasons, for maybe you could even say aesthetic reasons, but these two rows actually belong right here, spreading the whole thing out. But you can see either we would have to make the poster another three and a half feet long, right? Which would be, which would be a material cost to the producer. Or we would have to, using this size of poster, everything would have to get a lot tinier so that we could fit that whole thing on here. Those would be our two choices. Neither is good. So the best choice is usually to, to bring these two rows out. Does that make sense? By the way, what are these two things called? We're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but these are called the what and what series. And the lanthanide and actinide series. We'll come back to that. But those are called the lanthanide and actinide series. So I'm going to erase this because we don't need it. That's not how we usually represent the periodic table, but it would be a true way to represent the periodic table. Remember back to chapter 16, who, who is considered the father of this idea, the progenitor of the idea of organizing the periodic table like this? Newton. No. You remember? It's a Russian guy called Putin. Dmitry Dmitriyev. Mendeleev. Mendeleev. He was one of, I think he was a vocab word in chapter 16. Anyway, the man's name was Dmitry Mendeleev. He was a Russian. He's dead now. He, he I think something like the story goes that he was, um, he had the known elements uh, 
printed or or written on cards, and he was kind of organizing them and effectively like playing solitaire with them, and he came across this way of doing it, such that they repeated. And that's why we call these periods, because remember, a period is something that repeats. The period of a uh, pendulum swinging on a clock, the, that period is how long it takes to repeat. A periodical is a magazine or a newspaper that comes out again every week or month or quarter or whatever. A period is something that repeats, and so in the periods on the periodic table, the types of elements repeat. S skipping period one, but period two, we always have, you can see up here, this one is color coded. We have two light metals and then five non-metals and then a noble gas. And then it repeats. Two light metals and now a metalloid and four non-metals and a gas, etc. And they repeat. In that same, it's not it's not one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, or even one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's more like one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. But it does there's a pattern. You know how patterns sometimes do that. Like even when you're in kindergarten learning about patterns, it's not always cat dog. Sometimes there's a pattern within the pattern. Like every time a new dog is added, so it's cat dog, cat dog dog cat, dog, dog, dog. You know, you know what I'm talking about? There can be a, a meta pattern. Anyway, all of that aside, these, these elements repeat in their what? Just in their names or how we talk about them? No, their what? What repeats? What is periodic in the periodic table? Their properties. Their properties repeat. So as I said, we have a light metal, and then another light metal, and then five metal, non-metals, a noble gas, which is also a kind of non-metal. And then that repeats. The properties repeat. Do you remember what was the most mind-blowing thing you learned about the periodic table last time? How, what's, the, what's a nice, easy way we can use the periodic table to find something that's otherwise pretty complicated to find? Do you remember? Um, the Their symbol, you mean? That's not what I'm referring to. Do you remember? There was a really super easy way to find something that we usually, that we thought we were going to have to draw an atom every single time and put the electrons in orbitals and then figure out how many electrons were on the outside, but there was a much easier way. Because of the way the periodic table is arranged, remember I wrote those numbers up there in your, yeah, Kimber. Oh, in the columns. Go on, Kimber. Yeah, what can you tell by the columns? The number of? Valence electrons, right. So these families and groups are also, now that we're talking about families and groups, we have these vertical, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I think that's one too many, again. I kind of had to shorten them up towards the end there. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't super matter. I'm not trying to draw like, I'm not going to fill this in. One, two, let's start with this. That was two, that divided into two, three, four, five, Six. Oh heck! Well, we can just make him a little bit skinnier. There we go. Okay. Um. So these families, we have group, and these are called two different things. Um, either this is group one or one a. This is group two or two a. We sometimes call these groups three through twelve, or three b through twelve. B. And then when we start up here, we either call it group 13 or group 3A. You can see, why, 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 might we want there to, why might we want there to be two different naming schemes? Why might the 3A be an a easier thing to use sometimes? You see, this is what I wrote on the board was the, the 3A naming scheme. Why is that better for some things? It, what, what do those numbers tell us, the ones I wrote up there? The valence electrons. So if we're if we're thinking about this as three a, that tells us there are three valence electrons in the elements in this group, which there are. And then this one is, four a. yeah, either fourteen or four a. Then this one is fifteen or five a. This one is sixteen or six a. This one is seventeen. Oh, I didn't I didn't want to draw the line. Or seven a. And then this one is. Okay, I, I did draw one too many. How do I keep doing this? Sorry. No, the opposite of that. Just a flat moron. Okay, uh, that was 17. This one should be then, 
18 or 8a. Be nice to yourself. Use positive self-talk, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Are there the right number in here? I would be surprised. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That's wrong. Yeah, don't do that anymore. There are supposed to be 12 in there. Please forgive me. <coughs> does this, does this, does how these are numbered make sense? And what have I numbered there? What things have I numbered? No. The groups. The groups or the families. And then we can use that information to get the number of valence electrons. Okay. Um, so we, we have, we know what groups and families are. And we know what periods are, right? What, is, what does the word properties mean? What are we talking about when we talk about the properties of something? In this case, we're talking about the properties of elements. But what, is the, what does properties mean? What's a property of, of Haley Huron? Red. Pink hair. Yeah, that's very noticeable. What's a property of Gunner Lemon? Be nice. Beautiful. Beautiful. Like crazy. I was thinking yellow sweatshirt. I was actually, as I'm surveying the room, I'm thinking about most noticeable things in the room, and it was, in order, Haley's hair, Gunner's sweatshirt. Like <laughs> Great, Kesslin. <Kessler. laughs> Thanks. Okay, so properties are, are things about that element. They are um, true statements about a an we'll say an entity that makes it sound very scientific an entity is just a thing uh some thing something so what are some properties of the elements well that's what we're going to get to today that's the that's the point of so this should all be a review you should know how the periodic table is broken up and arranged you should know what properties are you should even remember P dmitry mendeleev that was all review now we're going to talk about the actual properties of the elements. The first thing we want to talk about is this, and you can see it, it's orange on there. I'm going to draw it in orange. It's not very super visible on there. You may draw it on your periodic table if you have it because it's not on there, but I, you don't have to, but um, I'm going to draw it up here. This is called the stair step line. It kind of actually fades out right here. We don't really know what's going to happen to it, but that orange thing is called the stair step. Why do you think it might be called that line? It looks like stairs. And what does the stair step line tell us? Oh, dang, I really messed up big time here. Oh, heck, I really messed up. Forgive me. I had to, I went right when I should have gone down. There we go. And then it kind of, like I say, it kind of fades out because we don't really know about the properties of those below it. They are, uh, uh, what? Ever, I don't understand. What, the stair step line itself is nonmetals? No. There we go. Okay. Yeah, it separates the regions of the periodic table between metals on the left and non-metals on the right. We're going to talk generally about the properties of metals and the properties of non-metals before we move on. So everything over here to the left of the stair-step line, all this, is metals, are metals. All those elements are metals. And then everything to the right of the stair-step line, all of this, are non-metals. Okay, so far so good. What if it touches the stair step line? Then it's, on which it's side? darker. It's pinker. It, it's gonna be pink. It's border. It's border. I don't know what you mean by that. What if it touches the stair step line, homies? You should have known this from your vocab. What if an element is touching the stair step line? This was a vocab word. The ones that are touching the stair step line, except, except aluminum, the ones that are touching the stair step line, except aluminum, are metalloids. Which means, the suffix oid means like something. So if I said something was werewolfoid, that would be like a werewolf. So metalloids are like metals, and they're also like nonmetals. So we have these three very broad categories of, of elements on the periodic table. Could you and this will be on your test, could you, uh, given any random element, could you tell me whether it was a metal, non-metal, or metalloid? Let's do vanadium. Vanadium is number 23. Tell me if it's a metal, non-metal. Don't look at the colors of the borders. That's not what we're doing here. No, let's try again. Vanadium, 23. Look at it. No, no, no. Do not look at the borders. Just know what I just told you. Looking at it. 
It's a metal. It's to the left of the stair step line, so it's a metal. Um, what about chlorine, number 17? It's a non-metal. What about potassium, number 19? Metal. Metal, yeah, because it's to the left of the stair step line. Thank you. Here are the properties of metals. Let's, let's write them down. You should know them because it was a lot of them were your vocab words. Properties of metals. Properties, remember things about it, things true about metals. Properties of metals. Let's, let's list them and then we're going to erase it and we're going to list the properties of non-metals. Give me a property of, an, of a metal. You know what metal is. You've known what metal is since you were four years old and someone said that's, that's metal. What, what is a metal? Well, give me a property of a metal. Usually hard. We're not going to put that though. High melting point, let's put that. High melting point. Meaning what? Uh, it takes a lot of uh, thermal energy. It takes a lot of thermal energy to cause this to change from solid. solid to liquid. If this is true, then what else is probably true? What's another property of metals that's probably true? Most are. Most are. Solid. Most are solid at room temperature. Other than gallium, no gallium is at room temperature. Other than mercury. Mercury is the only one that's uh, an exception. Most are solid at room temperature. What's another property of a metal? These are vocab words. You should, really should know these. We already have that one. What? Ductile. ductile. Or ductile is how we sometimes say it. Meaning what? That's a vocab word. You have to know that. I'm not going to write the, the definition because you did your vocab. What, but what does it mean? And you can write it. No. You have to know these. Um, ductile means it can be drawn out into a wire. That you, can, that you can squeeze it through a little hole and it'll be drawn out into a wire. Um, what's the other one that's kind of like that one? Malleable. From the root word, from the Latin root word malleus, as in malleus mellificar and the witch hammer. Malleable from the Latin malleus meaning hammer. No. Easily, yeah, we, it's easily. yeah. We can you can easily bendable. Maybe you could you can beat it into a sheet. Like you, if you have a lump of metal, you can hit it with a hammer, and it'll eventually become a sheet. Some metals are more malleable than others, and malleable also just means, as a kind of metaphorical way, it means easy to be changed. So if I say that you have a malleable little brain, that means that depending on the things people say to you, you can your brain changes. What else? What's another property of a metal? You do have to know these two. I'm, I'm writing them. I'm not writing their definitions, but you have to know their definitions. What's another one? Someone said it when they thought this was the definition of ductile, but it wasn't. Yes? Found in the ground. Mm -mm. No, electric. Mm -hmm. good, conductors. good conductors of not just electricity, and heat. heat and electricity. And you should know what that means from when we talked about this in chapter 7. If you don't, you need to go back and look that up. <coughs> We talked about good conductors of electricity in chapter 7. We talked about good conductors of heat in 5, I believe. So go back and look those up if you don't remember what that is. But those are the properties of metals. High melting point, extremely high boiling point, right? If we were trying, even mercury has a relatively high boiling point. If we want to make the, the liquid into a gas, that's an extremely high temperature. Most are solid, ductile, malleable. You need to know what those mean. I'll even write vocab here next to it. And they're good conductors of heat and electricity. Let's do now the properties of non-metals. Now let's kind of compare those to the properties of metals. Properties of non-metals. Let's just go down the list of metals and we'll contrast them. So if metals had a high melting point, what's probably true of non-metals? Low, Low melting point. And we're going to write it this way. We're going to write either gases or low melting point solids at room temperature. So when things are room temperature, nonmetals are either gases. Give me an example of a gas, of a nonmetal that's a gas. Gallium. No. Radon. Radon is a nonmetal that's a gas. Well, on this one, you can see because they're blue. I just, I also just know. But the, the ones that are written in blue are gases. Chlorine. chlorine and fluorine are gases at room temperature. What's a non metal that's a solid? Which one is that yellow? Boron. Boron. Nope. Boron's a, a metalloid. Um, silicon's a metalloid. 
because those touch the stair tip line. Carbon. Carbon. Um, carbon doesn't really have a, it, I'm sure it does have a melting, in fact I know it does, but in, in our oxygen environment carbon just burns, but when, you, when it is melted, carbon has a low melting point. So either gases or low melting point solids at room temperature. That kind of addresses both these first two. Are they ductile and malleable? No, metals were, so non-metals are not. It would be kind of the opposite of that. What happens if, I don't know, you probably have no experience with any of these sulfur or carbon, I guess carbon you probably do, you like charcoal briquette? If, if, in, if a metal, if you hit a metal with a hammer, it does what? It, it bends. That's what malleable means. If you hit charcoal, like coal, like breaks. carbon, with a hammer, it breaks. And what do we call that property? They are either, once again, either gases, which you can't really hit with a hammer, either gases or, what, what's the better word? Like brittle. Brittle. Brittle solids. either gases or brittle solids. And then if metals were good conductors of heat and electricity, poor conductors of heat and electricity. Shh. Poor conductors of heat and electricity. And then this is going to make it a lot easier. What's true of metalloids? What are the properties of metalloids like? Are they're no, it's just some properties of some properties of metals and some properties of nonmetals. E each metalloid has properties either in between that of a metal and a nonmetal, or it has some properties of a metal and some properties of a of a nonmetal. Okay, next we're going to go through each of the groups and we're going to talk about some of the properties of it. I'm going to erase the properties of metals because I think everyone has them done. And I'm going to use this space that is freed up by that erasure to talk about, we're going to start by talking about, I'm going to have these two areas open again, we're just going to kind of flip flop back so that people can still take notes if they've missed out a little bit. So now we're going to be talking about the properties of individual groups. We're going to start with properties of, I'm going to fill in the blank here for each of these. We're going to first talk about group 1A, or also sometimes called group 1. It has a name. Group 1, where, first of all, Carson, would you please point at group 1 so that we can all see it? And I'm going to point at it on the whiteboard when you're done. No, would you actually point, like stand up and actually physically touch it so people know which one we're talking about? We're talking about group one, which is also called family one, which is also called group one A, which is also called family one A. And Carson is correctly pointing at it. It's this one. Bloop. What's this group? One A, or sometimes called group one. It has a name. You should know it from your book. I don't think it was a vocab word, but you probably should know it. It's called the alkali. You do need to know this for your test. The alkali metals. You've probably heard the word alkali before, I would guess. Um, alkali is sometimes used as a synonym, actually the word alkaline is sometimes used as a synonym for uh, basic, like a, the opposite of an acid. People sometimes talk about the alkali lakes that are kind of like east of Alliance because the ground is ash and so when water gets on it, the lakes are very basic and it's said that if a cow dies and falls in there, its body will be dissolved in a month, which is really cool, but that's, just, that's, what, that's one of the properties of bases. Like you remember from Breaking Bad, a TV show I've never watched that you should also not watch, um, but I've seen the YouTube video of when they murder a guy and they have to get rid of him, they dissolve him. In, in that case, acid, but a better way would be to use a strong base. Alkali metals. How many valence electrons? We're going to do this for all of them. We're going to name them and then we're going to say how many valence electrons. Valence electrons, this is defines the alkali metals. Valence electrons, how many? One. Why did only Aaron say that? Everyone should have known that. How do you tell me valence electrons a particular group has? It's, yeah, it's in the first group, so it has one valence electron. Um, we're not going to write them down because you have a periodic table, but let's list the elements in the alkali metals. We don't normally include hydrogen. Hydrogen is kind of its own little baby. You can see it's a non-metal. It is not considered an alkali metal. It's its own separate thing. So what are the alkali metals? Let's list them. Lithium, uh, sodium, we're all going to say it together. Potassium, 
rubidium, cesium, francium are the alkali metals. So those are the alkali metals. And they are usually soft metals. The sodium, it's even better with the potassium. The potassium has kind of the consistency of Play-Doh. Like when I get the, you wouldn't want to touch it with your bare hands. Um, maybe, maybe tomorrow we'll show you why. I'll explode some of them. But you can like squish it up like Play-Doh. It's a metal. The sodium, you can cut with a knife. Like it's, it's, that one feels like cheese. The lithium's a little bit harder. But as you go down, they get softer and softer. The cesium is only barely solid. It melts just above room temperature. So they're soft metals. Next one is next one we're going to talk about. Oh, and also all these ones have a specific flame test color, which you need to know about. But you already have that data. Where do you find that data? In your lab. In your lab. So they all have a they all have a nice, lovely flame test color. Remember, lithium was that beautiful crimson color. Sodium was yellow. Potassium was like that ghostly purple. Rubidium is red. That's actually why it's named that. Um, cesium is light blue. Francium, no one knows because it doesn't really doesn't really exist. Um, now we're talking about properties of, we're going to move on to 2A. What are these called? Alkaline earth metals. The way, the best way to remember this is that group one has one word and then metals. Group two has two words and then metals. Alkaline metals was group one. Alkaline earth metals is group two. Valence electrons? Two. two. These ones are, are um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have put over here. These, the alkali metals are very reactive. Very reactive. If you put any of these in water, it will explode. And we're going to do that in the lab tomorrow if you're good. Um, the, they're slightly harder, but still somewhat soft. The group two ones, I mean. Somewhat soft. They all have a particular flame test color, too. And they are... Um, if we said very reactive here, we'll put quite reactive for the group two ones. They're not as reactive. Why would that be? What makes group one so reactive? It's in the very first yeah, how many valence electrons? One. one. It really, really wants to get rid of that one so it can meet the octet rule. This one has to get rid of two, so it takes a little bit more energy. <clears throat> group 2A are quite reactive. I'm going to move back over here and we're going to talk about groups 3 through 12 which is also sometimes called 3b through 12b this whole chunk here this whole block 3 through 12 all of these most of the elements on the periodic table are called what you should know from your vocab Let's look. Transition. transition metals. These are all transition metals. These are the ones, not all of them, but these are these include the ones that we normally think of when we think of metal, like iron, copper, gold, silver. They're transition metals. They all have, we're going to put a little like approximately equal to here, but they usually have two valence electrons. But they can bond with their non-valence electrons to some extent. <clears throat> um, there are specific groups within them, such as, which you read about, um, the iron, cobalt, and nickel group, the copper, silver, and gold group, which are sometimes called the coinage metals, and the zinc, cadmium, and mercury groups. But we're not going to worry too much about those. Just know where the transition elements are. And then, what we call... Yeah. I mean, obviously there's more about them, but in order for the sake of time, we're just going to say that that's their name, transition metals, and they all have approximately two valence electrons. And then we're going to call these, this, this, these two chunks down here, we call them the, let's call, let's label it the inner transition. That's these two ones that are sometimes taken out. And we call the top one the lanthanide series after its first one, lanthanum, lanthanide and actinide series. Just know where those are for now. We'll talk more about them in chemistry, but for now, just know where those are. Those are the sometimes called the inner transition metals, and they're the lanthanide and the actinide. You should probably know which one's which, but it's really not very hard. Lanthanum is then all those after it are the lanthanide series, and the actinium, all those after it are the actinide series. Yes, Fate. Yes, 
Yep. Yeah, go on. Okay. Um, the next one we have to talk about is we're going to let's just name 3, 4, 5, and 6. Or I should say 3A, 4A, 5A, and 6A. We're just going to name those for now. Um, 3A is, is sometimes, it's usually just called group 3, but if we want to be really, really fancy, we sometimes call it the icosagens. 4A, once again, we usually just call it group 4, but we sometimes call it the crystallogens. 5A, we very, actually very commonly call the nictogens, and 6A, we call the chalcogens. Just write those down for now. What's the second one? Crystallogens. I'm, I'm not terribly worried about those. Just know that they exist. Know how to find the number of valence electrons. Be aware of what elements are in them. You don't have to memorize what elements are in them. But like, for instance, if it says, your test would go as far as to say, what group number is phosphorus in? And you would say five. It's not going to say, what's the name of group five? Chalcogens. Icosogens. And then the last one we're going to, well, we actually have two more to talk about real quick. Group seven, oops, sorry. Um, I, this is not the way I was doing it before. Group seven, A, is called the halogens. And these are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, astatine, and tennessine, if we want to include it. Um, but these are all extremely reactive, extremely reactive. Because kind of like the alkali metals that only had to give up one, the halogens only need one, and then they have a full octet rule. Remember, we talked about the octet rule. So they're very, very, very reactive. Unlike the alkali metals, which got more reactive as we go down the list, the halogens get less reactive. Fluorine is the most reactive halogen. They're called halogens because they make salt. Gens, like Genesis, the beginning of the making of. Halos is the uh, Greek word for salt. And then lastly, we have group 8A, which is called the noble gases. What's probably true of the noble gases? How, they're noble. What does noble mean in this context, do you think? Honorable. They're non-reactive. They don't react. They don't get into the affairs of the common little rabble. Non-reactive. They do not react. Because they already have a full octet rule. I know that was really fast. Um, Mostly what I want you to know are the, certainly the way the periodic table is arranged, the properties of the metals, nonmetals, and metalloids, and then the names of the various groups. Do you have any questions very, very briefly?